everybody. Welcome. Um, welcome to bringing 2020 to a close. I didn't think this day would ever come. It's been a quite challenging year to say the least. Um, we've had a lot of ch changes that came with 2020. Um, and I'll start with, instead of discussing where we are right now today, let me go backwards first, because if I go backwards a little bit and make sure everybody gets all the new laws, um, we can talk about where we are today and what we anticipate seeing going forward. <clears throat> We've had a lot of changes that came with uh, 2020. The very first thing we had was the statewide rent control initiative, AB 1482. Um, and basically what AB 1482 says is the entire state is subject to rent control. It varies in many different moving parts. Uh, if there were more than two dwellings on a parcel and the owner does not live in one of the dwellings or units, you have rent control. If the building's over 15 years old, you most likely have rent control. How the title of ownership of the property is held could make you have rent control. This could mean that you are limited on what you can increase your rents on an annual basis. Um, a lot of us are now controlled by this initiative and we're capped out at the CPI, which is the consumer price index, plus um, whatever the rate of inflation is for our areas. So we're looking at pretty much 5% plus the CPI across the board. Um, it gets a little tricky if you, are <laughs> oh, I, I I don't this this one has a lot of moving parts to you guys so let me just say if you want to terminate tenancy without cause under AB 1482 you're most likely going to have to pay relocation fees to your tenant those are comparable to one month's worth of rent um, if your tenant or if your property was exempt from the statewide rent control, we needed to notify our tenants in writing earlier this year, back in June. Um, this disclosure about rent, and con rent control being exempt from the rent control, it has sp specific language. It has to be written in 10 point font. And what does all of that mean in simple English of what I'm trying to tell you is you can't just write a letter, this property doesn't have rent control and send that to your tenant. It has specific verbiage in it and you have to use that verbiage. So you need to contact your legal counsel, your apartment association to make sure you have the proper, proper verbi verbiage or your time and effort is pointless. All of this for AB 1482 is a new 15 page assembly bill with lots of moving parts. And the purpose of today is not to dig into the depth of this bill, but just make you aware of its existence. Okay, so we do have statewide rent control now. It could affect all of us. Okay, this happened January 1. Um, the next thing that we have that we all need to be aware of if we weren't paying attention is Active military became a protective class within the eyes of fair housing in California. Active military also have security deposit restrictions as in how much a landlord can collect. Current law states that two months, that we can ask for two months worth of rent on a vacant unit and three times the amount of the rent on a furnished unit. The new active duty military law says that we can only ask for one times the amount of the rent on a vacant unit and two times the amount of the rent on a fully furnished unit. <clears throat> and this only applies to active duty military, okay? <clears throat> Let me talk about something really quickly as we get into discrimination because that's pretty much what we're talking here if we do charge them higher on their deposit, it could be considered discriminatory. So let me talk to you guys really quick about my three biggest concerns. These are my three big pet peeves regarding um, discrimination. And I want to share them with you so that we can bring them to light and I stop seeing them not only in print and advertising, but also in the words that you speak. So I want you to be really, really careful. Um, with what you do and what you say, because quite frankly, they could hang you with it. 
so <laughs> let, let me talk to you and go down a rabbit hole really quick, just so that I'm doing you guys all a big solid, okay? And I'm trying here. But um, my, biggest, my biggest pet peeves when you're advertising and you're putting something in print as well as your written and oral communications, um, and these are in no particular order, okay? Number one that I have is walk or any variation of the word walk. Stop using it. Please, I beg you. Example, walk-in closets, walking distance. I hate to tell you guys this, but if you think about it for a second or two, you're discriminating against humans that can't walk, simply said. Instead of using walk-in closet, use oversized, spacious, words like that. Um, we don't want to discriminate against anyone intentionally, and we sure don't want to put it in print, okay, and hang ourselves. So just something to think about. Stop using the word walk. <laughs> think about that one. And then I actually have a slide for my second one. Um, Hootie's pulling. Oh, no, I missed. Say, oh, we're there. There. There we are. We got it. Single. The word single or singles, okay? I gave you three examples here, okay? So let's talk about them. Um, single or singles, uh, if number one, the studio apartment is available for singles only. Number two, the one bed unit is for a single person only. Number three, max occupancy is for a single person only. Which one is most likely considered discrimination? <laughs> Think about this for a minute, you guys. The answer is, next slide. All of them. Stop using the word single. Use numbers instead. Example, maximum, maximum occupancy for this unit is for one person only. When you use the word single, you're, are you speaking of someone that is unmarried or are you speaking about one occupant? And while you're spending the two most expensive things in this business, both time and money, and most likely the amount of your life savings to fight in court that you met one occupant because you would never discriminate against marital status, just stop using the word. Just write and speak with terms of maximum one occupant. Stop using the word single. You're subjecting yourself to lawsuits like nobody's business and it's expensive and if you goof, it's really expensive. So please stop using the word single or singles, okay? Use the number one instead, you're better off. Um, next one and my last one is stop using the words kids, children, minors, play or playing. They're all a protected class. And anything that you are going to say or write using one of those many variations I just gave you, kids, children, minors, play or playing, um, is most likely going to be considered discrimination in the state of California. In fact, there is only one place that you can legally use the word children and it not be considered discrimination. And that is on the signage for a swimming pool. And it states children under the age of 14 using the pool must be accompanied by an adult at all times. That is California state law and the only place you can ever and should ever use the word children. Okay, just trying to help you guys here. Um, example, they are not kids, they are not children, they are occupants from within your unit. Example, the bad example is your kids were seen throwing rocks in the pool. A better choice um, may be occupants from within your unit were seen throwing rocks in the pool. Much better choice, okay? So please stop unless you like lawsuits being delivered to your door. Ding dong, look, here comes another one. <laughs> Sorry, enough with my rant. Let's get back to where we were headed. I just wanna tell you guys, there's three pet peeves there for me. One is children, one is singles, and the other one is walk. And they're red flags for lawsuits in my opinion. So we wanna stay clear of that kind of stuff. Um, another one that we got, yeah. We got <laughs> that we can no longer count weekends or holidays in the expiration of a notice or in the answer period of an eviction. From the time of service to the summons and request for entry of default. So what did I just say as simply as I could put it? Evictions are gonna take longer. We can't count holidays and weekends on the expiration of a notice. And from the time the tenant has to file an answer with the court, we can't 
count weekends and holidays there either. So simply said, we're going to see that go um, a little bit, a little bit longer, um, take a little bit longer. Um, also, a big one that I want to help you guys with is we can no longer say that we're not participating in Section 8 housing. It's considered discrimination against the source of income. So a much better choice in your words when asked would be, yes, I accept Section 8. All applicants must meet my criteria. Okay, that's some better choice for you. Yes, you have to take it. We're being forced to participate in the program. But if the applicant doesn't meet your criteria, then you wouldn't rent to them anyway. So <laughs> as simply as you can say it, yes, I accept Section 8. You must meet my criteria. It keeps things very simple. Please also note that this also applies to all federally funded programs, including the VASH program, which is a veterans assistance housing program. So be careful that you're not screaming discrimination at hello. You cannot advertise no Section 8 anymore. Um, you could get sued and it's expensive. So now that we got through that, um, just want to touch base. Uh, hang on, let me catch up with myself on my notes. <laughs> Sorry. Don't think too hard about not counting weekends and holidays in the notice expiration. And if I could do you guys a solid, I'm going to do you a solid right now. Watch out for next month. Here, what, in a couple days, two, three days? Um, January 2021 is right right near us and want to tell you guys a couple of things about that. Um, if your rent is due on the first, the first is a holiday. So your rent can't be due on a holiday or a weekend. Okay. So I know your lease contract says that your rent is due on the first of the month, but what that really means is it's due on the first business day of the month. Okay. <laughs> so that's what that means, the first business day. So the first of January is a holiday, New Year's Day. The second is a Saturday, so it's still not due yet. The third is a Sunday, still not due yet. Monday, the fourth, is the very first legal day that rent could possibly be due in the month of January. And it's not until the 5th of January that your rent becomes delinquent and you can actually serve that notice. So be careful with what day of the week your the first of the month falls on, if the first is your due date, okay? So anybody that serves a 15-day notice to pay rent or quit before January 1st, from the 1st to the 4th, um, your notice is bad on its face, and I probably wouldn't attempt to do anything with it other than use it for toilet paper because it's not good for anything but that, okay? You got to wait till the 5th or after because the rent isn't due until the first business day of the month. I hope everybody understands that. Okay, so now that we got through all of that, let's talk about what happened in March. In March, COVID-19 hit us, okay, in March. And in the very beginning, things weren't so bad. I'm just saying, okay, not compared to where we are now. Um, in March, 98% of all the tenants in the state of California paid their rent. And we've pulled accounting software programs to come up with these numbers. So we pulled from Yardi, Rent Manager, Rent Collect. We hit all those databases. In April, it was at 98% of all tenants in the state of California paid their rent. And in May, it stayed the same. In June, it dropped to 94%. In July, it dropped to 91%. In August, it dropped to 86%. And this is also when the COVID unemployment stopped at the end of the month. And then came September 1st. Oh. The reason I say that is because that's when AB 3088 was initiated by our governor. It initiated a lot of things, okay? It initiated how we can terminate tenancy, when we can terminate tenancy, how we can evict. They initiated when our rent is due. Okay, the government is now telling us when our rent is due with this new bill. We can't charge late fees, we can't charge interest, we can't charge penalties. 
I'm going to get into the details and all the moving parts of that, but let me just say this. When AB 3088 came out, and the it's also known as the COVID Tenant Relief Act, rent collections dropped to 72%, and they fell steadily from there. In December, we're at 57% of the entire state of California, tenant occupied, have not paid the rent. So it's been declining since this act came out. Let's start with the money that's owed from March through August, okay? Let's start there. The money that's owed from March through the last day of August of 2020, this past due rent is now considered consumer debt and will not ever, never, ever, seven times never be able to evict for it. It is consumer debt, okay? You can only sue in small claims for that money but not until March of 2021, okay? So for all the rents owed for March, April, May, June, July, and August, April, May, June, July, August, six months, we can never evict for that money. We can only sue them in small claims court starting in March. And they have removed the cap amounts for landlord tenant debt in small claims and made those amounts unlimited. So they changed the court system around a little bit. If we're suing for COVID rents, those amounts are unlimited. Here's me talking to you now, okay? <laughs> if everybody can't do anything except get a judgment against them and try to pursue them in collections for this rent money and we can't do it until the 1st of March, my question to you becomes, how inundated is small claims court gonna get very quickly? <laughs> um, something to think about. Uh, your statute of limitations on an oral agreement is two years and on a written contract is four years. So you may want to wait just a couple months before you go file that small claims action just so that you're not lost in the shuffle or running with the masses for lack of a better way to explain it. We don't want to get lost in the court system. We want to be upfront and, and personal, right? Because <laughs> this is our, our money. This is our income we're talking about. This is our livelihood. So you may want to consider just a little bit of a delay so that you're not in that bum rush for small claims court. Just saying. Now, they rewrote the way the rent is due. Um, for rent monies for September, October, November, December, and the month of January, only 25% of the rent is due on or before January 31st. And all they have to do, the tenant, is turn in a declaration stating that they were affected by COVID. Here's the reality of that. The word affected is a very broad term and can easily be argued in court by either party, because let me tell you something, we've all been affected. I've had to buy masks. I have to wear them in public. I've had to buy hand sanitizer in boatloads, not normally what I would purchase. Um, so we've all been affected in different ways. If our tenant isn't paying the rent, then we've been affected. But the reality of the situation is affected is a broad term and can be easily argued in court by both parties. So <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> it gets a little bit more challenging. They took away our three-day notice to pay rent or quit, and they took away our three-day covenant notice for monetary damages. What did I just say in English? If it has to do with money, it's on a 15-day notice, okay? They've been lobbying to give us a 15-day notice to pay rent or quit for quite some time now, and we've defeated it with the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act and AB 3088, I don't know that we'll ever get a three-day notice to pay rent or quit back, okay? They might have just rewrote the rules and we might be on a 15-day notice going forward. I don't know. My crystal ball's broken. I do know we've been fighting it for quite some time and succeeding until this happened. Okay, just saying. So something you may want to consider and think about. Also, 
th this AB3088, let me give you guys an example of why I pause so much when I go to talk about a subject. Um, the Statewide Rent Control Initiative, AB1482, that initiative is 14 pages long, I believe. 14, one four. No, 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 I'm, I'm wrong. It's nine pages long, nine pages for statewide rent control with all these moving parts and paying relocation fees and terminating tenancy with cause, without cause, what we have to do, okay? <laughs> AB 3088 is over 30 pages, over 30 pages, okay? And it's got things about foreclosure, things about how we can terminate tenancy with cause, without cause. Um, it has about how, when our rents due on our rent schedule and how we can collect those rents and how it became consumer debt. It's got a lot of moving parts. So I'm gonna touch on each of the key facts and break them down as simply as I can for you to help you understand. AB 3088 says only 25% of the rent is due on or before January 31st. So it makes sense if you own investment property to make sure you serve that 15 day notice in January. That way on the 31st, if that 25% isn't paid, you should be able to pursue an eviction come February 1st for not getting the 25% of the rent. What we haven't discussed is when the 75% balance is due, okay? The 75% balance due actually becomes due the next day when the bill expires on February 1st. There is lots of talk about them extending AB 3088. Do I know what's gonna happen? Absolutely not, my crystal ball is broken but there is some serious talk of extending the 75% of the rent until February 1st of 2022, another year. What is gonna happen with February, March, April, May rents? We don't know yet. We don't know how they write the bill, but I could tell you this, we'll have that answer for you on or before January 28th. How do I know that? Because the bill expires on January 31st and that happens to be a, a weekend. So if they wanna amend, extend or modify, they're gonna have to do it the Friday before. So we will know on or before January 28th what the future holds for us, if you will, okay? <laughs> Terminating tenancy under COVID pandemic makes it extremely, extremely difficult because now the only reasons that we can terminate tenancy are for the cause courses that we get in the statewide rent control initiative. In other words, the owner wants to move back into the property or has a family member that wants to move back in. Mind you, when we say family member, the way that law is written is you can either go up your family tree or down your family tree, you can't go sideways. Simply said, you could rent to your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, but not necessarily your aunts, uncles, and cousins. We can't kick tenants out so that your cousin can move in. Okay, doesn't work that way. So they gave us those just cause provisions, reasons that we have cause, okay? Um, it would be material breaches of the lease for something other than rent. Okay, remember the rent's not even due until the end of January 31st and all they have to do is say they were affected and it's a broad term. With all that being said, I know, don't shoot the messenger, okay? <laughs> it, gets, it gets scary, it, it really does. And I feel your stress, I feel your pressure, I feel your pain. Remember, I own investment property. I have tenants that were affected by COVID. I had tenants that weren't paying the rent. Um, it, 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 I, I, I get it. Uh, we don't have any help as far as landlords go. If we got a forbearance from our mortgage company for six months or a year, then we have to pass that forbearance onto our tenant and can't even serve notice that they're in violation of their contract regarding funds until our forbearance expires. 
And to throw a monkey wrench in this whole thing, we haven't been able to do evictions until October 5th. The courts have been closed. They put a no eviction moratorium throughout the state. So October the 5th, everybody filed as many cases as they possibly could to go after rent monies or non-payments of rents even prior to COVID. And on October 7th, the Judicial Council changed the way that UDs get filed. They added a four page cover sheet that is very similar to the complaint actually. Um, but so anything that was submitted without that four page cover sheet got rejected. <laughs> okay, so not only do we have AB 3088 controlling us, it's just when we think we got the upper hand on it, the Judicial Council changes the way we file evictions. So what I'm trying to say to you as nicely as I could possibly say it is we've never had a global pandemic before. So they're writing the rules as we go along. There is no structured plan for this because it's never happened before. Okay, just saying. Don't get me on a ramp because it will never get me back. Okay, <laughs> sorry, but I'm a little frustrated with all of this. I think it's bureaucracy and bullshit at its finest. And yes, I did say that, okay? I don't think we should be controlled to the extent we're being controlled. I don't think it's fair that our rent isn't due yet, but we can be foreclosed on. How long do they anticipate that us as landlords can hold on to these properties without losing them to foreclosure? It's a very scary concept. And if they're gonna extend it even longer, when is the rent gonna be due? How do we pay these bills? I, it, it becomes very challenging for us very quickly. And again, I have skin in the game. I own investment property. I have tenants that were affected by COVID. I had tenants that didn't pay the rent. They're caught up now. Everything's good now. But who's to say that that's not going to change again? <laughs> Who knows? Um, for those of you that think that we're going to be lifted off of lockdown and that things are going to go accordingly and we're going to be able to do evictions, here's what I have to say to you. Stop listening to what people are telling you and start looking at what's happening. Our hospitals are at the all-time high. They're now putting tents in parking lots to treat patients because they don't have enough room. We're exhausting our medical resources. What makes you think that this is going to be over? by the end of next month. Because if you look at what's going on instead of what people are talking about and saying, you can make your own assessment of, we're gonna be in this for a while. People say, oh, we have a vaccination now, it'll be fine. How many people don't wanna be injected with the vaccination? I mean, thus far, they're not requiring us to do it, but who knows what the future is going to hold as far as that goes. And I have a lot of questions about the vaccination too, but we're not going down that road today. We're going to stay on the Tenant COVID Protection Act and what we're faced with as far as terminating tenancy and things of that nature. So please pay attention to me. I'm going to do my best to try to help you. Stop chasing the money. It isn't due yet. You need to document the money so when it is time to chase the money, all your ducks are in a row. A primary example of that would be January 5th, make sure you serve the COVID Tenant Protection Act to the tenant, the 15-day notice to pay rent or quit, and the COVID declaration because that's the month you need all your ducks in a row. You can put rent on there for September, October, November, December, and January. You cannot put anything prior to because the March through August is consumer debt and we can never evict for it. We can only sue in small claims. So very important that you know that. The reason that I say January is the best month to do that in is because that's when the 25% is due. So by the end of the month, if they haven't paid the 25%, you should be able to pursue that eviction on February 1st. But we'll see what happens and how they change the rules by then. You never know. If I could point you guys in a direction to have these questions answered, it would be pretty simple. Stop listening to what we're being told and start looking beyond our borders at what's happened and is still happening in some of the other countries that are dealing with this pandemic as well. Look at Italy. 
They went on lockdown twice and have pretty much lost their entire senior generation. That sucks. Look at China. They've been on lockdown three times now to the point where people were bolted into their homes so they wouldn't leave. And now, now that they're no longer on lockdown, they are suffering from the worst economy since 1972. What's going to happen to us? I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I really don't. But by looking at what's going on in other places, you can only assume that it's going to get worse here before it gets better. Okay, everybody got that? Stop chasing the money. It's not due yet. If you have material breaches of your lease contract that are non-monetary, and when I say the money, I'm talking about water bills, uh, charging them back for a broken window. Anything that has to do with money goes on a 15-day notice, whether it's a 15-day curable breach of covenant or a 15-day pay rent or quit. If it has to do with money, it goes on a 15-day notice, okay? If it doesn't have to do with money, our regular laws apply. Example, we saw that work orders throughout this pandemic are down by 78% across the board, meaning these tenants are in these houses, but they're not reporting to us repairs that need to be done. But they're there a lot more often now because most of them aren't going to work every day. With that being said, when's the last time that you served a 24 hour notice to enter and went into your property to make sure that you as the landlord are doing your job and providing habitable premises. When's the last time you did a preventative maintenance inspection? Because if your tenant doesn't let you in, you need to call your legal counsel. Chances are they're in violation of their written rental contract and also California Civil Code 1954. Just saying. So then, if they don't let you in, you could serve them a three-day curable breach of covenant for failure to allow entry. Everybody with me? <laughs> it's up to your legal counsel to tell you. And the reason that I keep going back to your legal counsel is because they know better than anybody else. They know better than I do. They're in these courts every day. So in LA County, they may tell you that you need to at least try to do the three-day curable three or four times before you give them the three-day notice to quit, depending on the situation and what the problem is at the property, versus San Bernardino County, who may say you can do a covenant once, and if they don't comply, you can do the three-day quit afterwards. Again, it's your attorney that can answer that question, not me, because they're in those courts every day. They know what flies with those judges and what doesn't. So that's who we need to listen to when it comes to terminating tenancy. For 20 years, and mark my words, we have always called our attorney and said, oh, my tenant's doing this and they're doing this. And we tell them this long drawn out story. And the attorney always asks the same question, but do they owe the rent? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they owe two months of rent. And the attorney has always said to us, look, we're just gonna forget the drama and go after the rent. It's the easiest way to get them out in California. It's the easiest way to get them out is non-payment of rent. Well, I hate to tell you this, but on September 1st, Governor Newsom changed that when he wrote AB 3088. Now the rent is the hard way to go. And going after the drama and the material breaches of the lease are the easy way to go. Am I saying one's easier than another one? No, not at all. But quite frankly, the money's not due yet. Everybody understand that? Okay. Somebody asked me, what are material breaches of the lease? Well, that's simple. It depends on what your rental agreement says. Are they all the same? No. So you can't call me and say, hey, Patty, if they change the locks on the door without my permission, because let's face it, that's something we all do as soon as we move into a new property. Is that considered a material breach of my lease? And my question always is, what does your lease contract say? <laughs> I can't read your lease. I don't know unless you send it to me what your lease says. Every one of them are different. Maybe it's not a lease. Maybe it's a rental agreement. Same concept, different verbiage. One's for a period of time, one, the other one's usually on a month to month. So 
With all of that being said, we're seeing a little bit more success at fast evictions, basing our cases on material breaches. And when it comes to material breaches, I can tell you this. Don't just put the one thing or the two things that you think have the most pull. Like, I'm going to give you an example, and then I'm going to play it out for you, and you can go, okay, I hear you now. If you find out that your tenant has unauthorized pets and unauthorized dog or unauthorized people, unauthorized occupants, unauthorized pets, and you decide to get all that together and do your three-day curable breach of covenant, they didn't fix it, you did your 24-hour notice to reinspect and you confirm they didn't come fix it, then you did your three-day to quit, and now you're in court. And they say, well, those aren't unauthorized occupants, those are my caregivers. Well, that theory just went out the window. And now those pets are emotional support animals. That theory just went out the window too. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is those are the two easiest things for them to argue and you to lose. <laughs> so don't go that direction, okay? <laughs> it's probably not a great idea if those two are there. It's a better choice for you and a better chance for you to be successful at your eviction if you name everything that they're doing wrong and let your attorney figure out what to argue and what not to argue. Quite frankly, it's above all of our pay grades. We're not attorneys. So my opinion to you, not my advice, because I can't give you advice, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> would be to go ahead and list everything they're doing wrong. They may have changed the door locks. They may have made modifications to the property by attaching a flat screen TV to the wall without your permission, okay? Everybody following along? <laughs> Changing locks is the most common. We all do it. As soon as we buy a new property, get a new property, we change the locks because we don't know who has a key. Um, depends on what's written in your lease contract. So you don't want to list one or two violations that you think have the most amount of teeth. You want to list everything that is wrong and let your legal counsel pick what has the most teeth because we don't know. We don't know. They know. We don't know. So give them all the ammunition you possibly can. It's very difficult when you get to court and the judge says, okay, they're caregivers and th that part of the case has been dismissed and that's an emotional support animal. So that part of the case is dismissed. Case dismissed, go home. And you say, wait a minute, wait a minute. They also changed the locks, broke the windows. They're destroying my property. Here's the problem. You didn't put it on the notice. If you didn't put it on the notice, it's really hard for your attorney to argue it. Does that make sense? <laughs> so you wanna give as much ammunition as you possibly can so that you're successful. <sighs> I know, I've talked to you guys a lot about this. <laughs> We're starting to see that cash for keys is becoming an option that's being utilized. If you are participating or attempting to participate in a cash for keys offer, please let me tell you this. Four people and only four people are allowed to do a cash for keys agreement. Only four people. That would be the owner of record. That would be your attorney. That would be your real estate agent or your real estate broker. It's a real estate transaction, so it needs to be handled accordingly. Don't have your sister go negotiate for you. You could be exposing her to practicing real estate without a license. I understand that the reason you want somebody else to go do that act for you is probably because the balance is broken. The balance between landlord and tenant has been broken. And you can't just go talk to them about paying them to vacate. I get that, I understand that. Um, once, once that balance is messed up, it's a little difficult. Um, so you may need to have someone else intervene and help assist you with that for that reason. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> So, Hootie, do we have some questions that I can answer? Because I know there's going to be a bunch of them. And I, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to start answering them. Uh, not yet. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Yes, 
please type it in the chat box and I'll try to get to all your questions. Um, I know there's a lot of them. Just remember the rent's not due until the end of next month. So chasing it, we are finding is becoming extremely difficult. Um, a lot of tenants are filing answers and including their declaration with their answer. A lot of tenants, when they get to court, they say we've been affected by COVID and chances are at that point, the judge is going to have the case dismissed. We are seeing now some courts asking the tenants to provide their financials and how they've been affected by COVID um, at court so that they can figure that out. So we are starting to see that happening um, in a much more in-depth and detailed way. Um, I'm assuming that that's gonna get expensive quickly because if you're having the judge review, that means you're in litigation and every time you go to court, you're paying your attorney for another appearance fee. So I get that that could be expensive very quickly. Um, I'll give you another loophole that we have in the system is if the property is an escrow, if it is an escrow, um, you can most likely serve a 30 day notice to terminate tenancy um, because it's an escrow. So we are seeing quite a bit of that going on. We're seeing um, people doing evictions because escrow is open on a property. Um, and so far that does seem to sit nicely um, in favor of the landlord. So just another approach, if you're wanting to kick your tenants out so you can fix up your property and then sell it, um, you may wanna consider selling it as is with the tenant in place because it's much easier um, to approach a sale that way rather than get them out right now. <laughs> it's, it's hard, <laughs> it's very difficult. Did we have a couple of questions come through? Yeah, first one, if we are not trying to evict, what disclosures, if any, do we need to serve next year? Um, you're not trying to evict and the tenants are paying the rent. At this point, we don't have any disclosures that need to be given. Uh, the COVID Tenant Protection Act is required that we disclose that to them when we serve the 15 day notice telling them what their rights are. So if your tenant's not delinquent at this point, I don't see any disclosures um, on the initiative or with bills that have passed that are gonna have requirements or drop dead dates. And I hope that answered your question. When can the cause provision reason be used to take back the property? The what provision? I didn't hear you. The cause provision reason. Okay, so those reasons come from AB 1482 and I'll tell you what they are. They are owner wants to move back into the property or relative. And we talked about going up the tree or down the tree, but not sideways. Um, the que the que I'm sorry, Patty. The question was when, when can they start using them? You can start using them now, as long as you don't have a moratorium on eviction moratorium. Currently LA County has a no eviction moratorium that's in place until January 31st. And the chances of that being extended to March 31st are high. Um, and I'm being honest with you. So reasons you can terminate tenancy right now would be you have escrow open, a material breach of the lease contract, you have to do major renovations to the property and you already have permits pulled. Um, you're completely removing the property from the rental market. And when I say that, um, I mean completely, don't think that you're just gonna take it off the market, evict these people and take it off the market for six months and put it back. Um, do they have a way to check and find out? Yeah, as soon as you put your advertisement up. Oops, <laughs> bet you didn't think about that. <laughs> so there's lots of moving parts there before you terminate tenancy or even attempt to terminate tenancy. I'd call your legal counsel, find out what the rules are so that you're not setting yourself up for failure. Okay, very important. Uh, the moratorium for LA County reads like this. Landlords may not even endeavor to evict. What does that mean in simple English? Hmm. Don't even serve the notice. It's not valid. 
Okay, so if you're trying to do something in LA County right now, I cannot encourage you enough. Talk to your legal counsel, listen to them. They, they are battling all of this on a different level and they know what will fly and what won't. It's over my pay grade, guys. <laughs> okay, next question. COVID stimulus bill passed recently includes cash for landlords and for tenants who can't pay. Do you know any details on this? I know a little bit about it. Um, I know that there's a few apartment associations out there that are much more active with it. When the funds are gone, the funds are gone. Um, I personally don't know of anyone that's been successfully paid from this at this point. Um, I don't know how those funds are being distributed. Do I, do, do I know that there's a program out there? Yes. Can I verify that anybody has received, actually received. I know people have been told they're going to receive, but they don't have money in their hands yet. So as far as that program goes, I, I don't have a whole lot of insight. Is it available? Yes. Um, your apartment association is probably going to be a better resource for you for answering that question than I am. Because my theory is just shoot them. <laughs> it's quicker. I'm kidding. Don't go shoot anybody. Fast Vic doesn't practice criminal law and they can't help you if you do. I know we're all a little frustrated, but we don't want to go shooting anybody. But yeah, that's always my first thought. <laughs> I don't act on those thoughts, just so you know. <laughs> what else do we got, Hoodie? Can you explain <clears throat> the statement you made about the landlord having a forbearance and extending it to the tenant? As a property manager, <laughs> what if we don't know that the owner has a forbearance? Um, you're going to have to know. <clears throat> because the way the Judicial Council rewrote the four page cover sheet, it's one of the questions that's asked. So you need to find out from management, I understand you're an on site, find out from building management if they got a forbearance on the mortgage. If they did, <laughs> you can't, you have to extend that forbearance to the tenant. So you can't go after them or evict them for non payment of rent if you don't owe the bank the money yet. Make sense? <clears throat> and you need to find out from management or your owners if they received a for forbearance. And if they did receive a forbearance, you need to know when that forbearance expires. And for somebody that doesn't understand what a forbearance is, I will quickly tell you, basically you're in a 30 year mortgage. You call the mortgage company and you tell the bank, hey, I can't make the pen and payments because my tenant's not making the payments and I need a forbearance. They give you a lot of paperwork to sign and fill out. And basically they take your 30 year loan and they make it a 30 year and six month loan. How does that benefit the bank? They get to collect interest longer. You are just deferring your payments for six months or a year or however long that forbearance is. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> what else do we got? If, if a tenant has been paying rent and now has two dogs, in a no animal building and no pets in the lease. I don't want to evict, but should I send a note that I'm aware of the animals are on the property? You can send them a three day curable breach of covenant for the unauthorized pets on the property, but I wouldn't act on it. It's too easy for them to get a note from anybody. And I said that anybody stating that they're emotional support animals. And let me just go down the emotional support animal um, the emotional support animal rabbit hole for a hot minute, okay? Just so everybody understands. The letter that says that somebody needs an emotional support animal doesn't need to come from a doctor. It can come from a priest, a life coach, a real estate broker. What the law says is a professional in the industry aware of their medical condition and their need for an animal. So simply said, I'm a real estate broker here in California, and I know that you guys manage investment property for a living. So I can assume that you get woken up in the middle of the night to remember if you did something properly or handled something properly. That would most likely be considered work-related stress. With that being said, because I'm a professional in the industry aware of your medical condition, I can write you a note for your emotional support animal because I also am aware of your need. 
See how easy that worked? It's very easy for them to get a note, okay? There is no national database where emotional support animals need to be kept and all of those things. And usually they don't tell us they have an emotional support animal. They just show up on the property one day. <clears throat> so you wanna, <clears throat> you wanna understand that when you're poking that bear, you're poking a little bit at fair housing just to make sure that you're not discriminating but you're really poking at ADA. And you wouldn't tell somebody with a wheelchair that they had to get insurance on their wheelchair, right? And you wouldn't tell somebody with a wheelchair that they can't have a wheelchair in your apartment. It's the same concept. It's an assistive device for someone that's disabled, okay? It's no different than a wheelchair. So you're picking at ADA law and poking a bear with really big teeth. I don't suggest it. <clears throat> Next one. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Patty. I'm a realtor. How do we go about listing and showing a tenant occupied property? Well, you can list the property uh, by all means as drive by only. You can show the property by serving a 24 hour notice. California Civil Code 1954 gives us several reasons on which we can uh, allow entry. One of them is to show the property to prospective pur purchasers. Um, and that's off the top of my head. So bear with me. Uh, prospective purchasers, mortgagees, mortgagors, blah, 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 blah. So you do have teeth to get in there and show it. Let me just say this, and I hope you're following along. <clears throat> if, they, if they call you and tell you you can't come in, that's when you call your attorney because now it's time to do that three-day notice, okay? The covenant notice, gear quit. If they stand at the door and tell you you can't come in, then again, you say thank you and you leave. This isn't a battle. Um, a battle comes in an emergency situation where they have to allow entry, and that would be fire, flood, mold. I mean, something that's endangering them or endangering the property in general. Example, my water heater broke. It's flooding everywhere. Okay, you show up and they say, oh, I'm not letting you in. I didn't serve notice. At that point, you call the police and ask them to help you gain entry because it's an emergency and you have a right to preserve property and mitigate the damages of whatever's going on. <clears throat> that is the time that you can call the police and they will help you gain access, but it has to be something bad, okay? Just like with an eviction right now that you're doing on cause, okay? In other words, they're in violation of all these lease terms. It has to be bad, you guys. You're asking a judge in the court of law to defy a government order based on what's happening in your property. If they're destroying your property, then they're destroying it. But don't file a case because they left dirty dishes in the sink. It's not going to fly, okay? Cleaning is a big yardstick measure that's different. Uh, my kids' idea of cleaning and my idea of cleaning, two totally different things, okay? Just saying. So you want to do something that has material. They've removed the smoke detectors. They've removed all the interior doors. They're drilling holes in the concrete in the kitchen. I mean, it's got to be bad, you guys. We can't, we can't do it frivolously just because we want our houses back. I get that. I understand. A better approach there may be cash for keys. Just saying. But remember, you're asking a judge in a court of law to defy a government order to shelter in place because of what's happening there. It better be good. Police reports, incident numbers, arrests made. These are all reasons that you could go that route as well. Um, and if you have something like that that's going on, you want to contact your legal counsel before you serve any notice. Because if you have an arrest at the property, chances are you are most likely going to be able to do a three-day notice to quit. In other words, they can't fix this. You got three days, get out, okay? But think about it when you're building this case, this has to have a lot of teeth in order for it to play all the way out in your favor. Okay, we got another one. To sell a home, tenant requires a 30-day or a 60-day notice to vacate its buyer to occupy. I'm going to give you guys a caveat, and I'm doing you a solid, so please pay attention, okay? I may ask questions later. 
the caveat that we have in the whole dichotomy of COVID is escrow. They can't tell us that we can or cannot purchase property. It's a violation of our civil rights, okay? We should be able to buy and sell. So that's the caveat there. Everybody with me? If you have an open escrow, you can serve a 30-day notice to terminate tenancy because the buyer intends on occupying the property. But it has to be in escrow when you serve the notice. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of people that are not providing in their sales transaction a vacant unit, but they are giving the buyer a $2,000 credit to help with any legal expenses and then assigning or hypothecating, if you want to use the real estate term, the notice through escrow. That way it doesn't die on its face. Remember, only an owner of record can pursue an eviction. So if it started with one owner and you're trying to finish it with another owner and you didn't assign the eviction or you didn't assign the notice, it falls dead when title changes. So do a solid to the person that's purchasing and assign that notice through the escrow department so that it still stays valid, okay? It becomes invalid when escrow closes and title changes, and now it causes a whole new dichotomy to the buyer, okay? So you want to serve the notice while escrow is open is the key there, and it is a 30-day, and it's a 30-day because it's in escrow. Okay, I hope that helped you. <laughs> Do we have another one, Huli? I'm not sure if this was kind of answered with what you just said, but if the owner wants to move a child in a rental, will we need to pay the tenant? Most likely, if you're susceptible to AB 1482, the Statewide Rent Control Act, yes. If you're in the city of Los Angeles, with their LARSO, absolutely. Only their re relocation fees aren't comparable to one month's rent. They range at about $22,000, give or take. 22,000. <laughs> Under what condition can we give notice to uh, move to a tenant without cause? As soon as the order to shelter in place is lifted. So, <laughs> How can I say this as nicely as possible? When your library opens, call your legal counsel and see when you can do it. And the reason that I say that is this, we still haven't heard from the Department of Fair Housing over what's a reasonable amount of time to either increase rents or terminate tenancy and it not be considered retaliation after a global pandemic. Because we've never had one before. And the reason that I'm going down this road with you is let's keep it simple. It's what my daddy always said, keep it simple, stupid. If fair housing says we can't terminate tenancy for six months if the tenant calls code enforcement, the health department, or even has bed bugs, even if they brought them in, we can't terminate tenancy for six months or it could be considered retaliation. What is a global pandemic going to do? We don't know yet. We haven't heard from fair housing yet. I'd love to be able to answer that question, but I don't know. The law hasn't been written yet. We may not have any restrictions where it's retaliation. You may be able to do a 60-day notice as soon as the order to shelter in place is lifted. I don't know yet. My anticipation that is fair housing will make that rule right before everything gets opened again. Because if you ask them now, they don't know. They just tell you, you know, you have to be ethical. And I, They're going to write it. Trust me. I think about it. I mean, bed bugs, six months we have to wait. What's a pandemic going to do? I would assume that it's going to be six months like everything else, but I don't know. I'm just assuming, and we know what that does. <laughs> Next one. I have served twice the 15 day notice package, and the tenant didn't return any forms. Can I evict? You can, but you need to understand something. It's a 50 50 chance for you. Okay, and what I mean by that is if the tenant files an answer and returns that declaration with the answer, then what? They've been affected by COVID. The rent's not due yet. Case dismissed, go home. If they don't show up, you could, you could prevail. We are seeing that happen. We are seeing some be successful. For me personally, 
and this is just me talking to you, a 50-50 shot isn't enough for me to spend time and money to go down that road. I want something with a little more teeth behind it before I get involved in litigation. And that's just me talking to you. That's my own personal opinion. I want better odds than 50-50. If I knew it was just going to be 50-50, I'd go put the mortgage money on black in Vegas. I mean, hey, <laughs> I got to have better odds in order for me to go legal. And that may have to do with me being a regional property manager for so long. But my theory was always this. I don't go to court unless I know I can win. And that's the way I did business. <laughs> so... Take that for what it's worth, but yeah, it's a 50-50 shot. If they don't show up, you most likely will continue on with the eviction. Um, for those of you in LA County that are in the middle of an eviction, uh, what we're seeing for them to enforce the no eviction moratorium is they're not issuing the default notification, which doesn't give you the writ of possession or a judgment in your favor. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're seeing it happen. We are seeing that law enforcement is helping us tremend tremendously. Um, they are serving the five day notice to get out. And then they're just not scheduling a lockout date is how they're enforcing that. But I'll tell you this, if your tenant vacates because the cops put that five day notice on their door, hit the easy button, they're gone, <laughs> okay? Go change the locks, call your attorney, let them know what's going on. Let them tell you the next process and procedure to take in order to protect you the best, okay? But yeah, hit the easy button if that happens to you because that's a nice one. And I'll take one more, Hootie, and then we'll answer the rest of them um, and send people an email where they can contact me on the website or on Facebook. If you guys don't know, please follow me on Widgets Way. I'm sure Hootie will put a slide up for me. Uh, you guys can email me there. You can call me through my website. I'm here to help. Uh, like I said, I own investment property. I have skin in the game. And that's my biggest goal is I want you guys to pick my brain. Don't make the mistakes that I've made throughout my career. Um, don't learn the hard way is what I'm trying to tell you. Ask me. I, I will tell you till I'm blue in the face a better way to approach whatever your problem is. I've been in this industry long enough that I've had enough murder, death, suicides, <laughs> fires, floods, molds. I've been through the trenches and some of these things I learned the hard way and I don't want anybody to learn those things the hard way. Okay. There's always a better approach. <laughs> okay. We got another one, Hootie. If, if we use the owner to take ownership and the owner moves in, but later his job career causes to move to a different city before the five-year required, does the owner have to offer back to, to the original tenant or can Absolutely. they put it back in the rental market? Nope. You've got to attempt to find the original tenant and re-rent to them at the same price they were paying before. And possibly with a slight increase, but not much, whatever um, the CPI is for that year and depending on where you're at. So it becomes tricky, becomes very tricky. Thank you for that slide, Hootie. I love it. <laughs> okay, one one more question, I'm sure. Okay. Um, I saw something about a 30-day notice. It's a 30-day notice to vacate even if the tenant has lived there for over five years. If you have an open escrow, you can most likely serve a 30-day notice to terminate tenancy, and it's because you have an open escrow, okay? If you're selling the property, it puts a whole different spin on what's going on. Remember, they can't stop us or confine us from purchasing or selling our investment properties. It's against our civil rights. So they had to leave a loophole in there for that. We're even seeing that fly on Section 8 properties. I've seen two of those go through. So just depends. <laughs> All right, you guys, um, please feel free to reach out to me, contact me. 
Hootie has my email up, so or actually has my website up. Um, we do something every Wednesday called Wednesdays with Widget, where we talk about current events and what's going on um, in the industry, where we see things going. And I'm telling you guys, on or before January 28th, we will have an update of what's going to happen with the 75% of the rent and also what's going to happen with rents for... February, March, April, May, June, and July. And the reason that I counted it down that way is they seem to work in either five months increments or six months increments. The first one, which is now consumer debt, which is the rent from March to August is six months. And then we have September to January, which comes out to be five. So we're seeing things go in a five to six month block, if you will. So I'm assuming because my crystal ball is broken, that on or before January 28th, we will have another set of rules or a different extension of time or something that becomes about with the rents that are due now, not to mention the new upcoming rents that we're going to be faced with going forward. So hope that helped answer that. <laughs> All right, you guys, if you need me for anything, hunt me down, call me, send me an email, feel free to join me on Widgets Way. I'd be more than happy to help walk you through. Remember that my area of expertise is property management and not necessarily legalities. That is what your legal counsel is for. I'm not an attorney. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great new year because we need to put this one behind us. Okay. <laughs> Remember, the money's not due yet. Stop chasing it go after cause, go get in that unit, find out what your property looks like. Make sure that you're providing habitable premises because when the rent becomes due, if the house is uninhabitable, they don't owe the rent. All right, you guys have a great weekend. Happy New Year. Please be safe. And thank you again for joining me. Bye-bye.